This program contains scenes that are dramatized, with special attention given to historical accuracy. They've got money to burn. They bet as much money as they can, whenever they can. 25, 50, even 100,000 a hand. The casino host was treating these guys like they were rock stars. And they're winning, big time. There were multiple sessions where I had won in a neighborhood of $150,000, $180,000. But they're not your typical Vegas high rollers. They're MIT students. The MIT team in the early 90s was the most feared team on earth. With an amazing secret plan to beat casinos for millions. I just flat out didn't believe them. I thought it was utter bullshit. Unless they get caught first. I was kind of like a gaming mortician. I had to put some people down. This is the true story of a handful of brilliant college students who mastered the art of breaking Vegas. There's nothing quite like it. Striding into a casino with a fortune in chips in your pockets. Master of the universe. And to just know that you're not alone. That you have a team behind you. Just know that you have the edge, that the odds are in your favor. It's pure mathematics. The house is going down. Hey, check this Russian guy out. Remember him from last month? He's the one the pit called up on. Those guys look familiar too. I'll make no for it. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. A hotbed of technological innovation since the 1860s. Home to the best and the brightest and home to a secret team of extraordinary blackjack players. The MIT blackjack team is a group of MIT students who play blackjack in a way that gives them an advantage over the casino for the purpose of winning money and having a lot of fun while we were doing it too. The team's MO? Card counting. Using mathematics to keep track of which cards are dealt in a given blackjack hand and then using that knowledge to guide play in future hands. There's no better place for this mathematical mischief than the campus of MIT. I mean, first of all, you've got geniuses who are geniuses at math and science. You also have slightly rebellious types of people, um, people who don't, you know, look at authority figures that well, who are willing to try something different. It is early 1992 and a legendary figure in MIT blackjack circles is about to set the blackjack world on fire. He is an MIT alumnus known as Mr. M. Mr. M reminded me of a nervous, nutty professor. Very warm, caring. He was fairly intense. I think he has the, the same kind of geekiness that a lot of people in MIT do, myself included. He's very honest and he wants to find the right answer. It's a very MIT type trait. In his mind, it's probably nothing but a computer. Strange. Terrible body hygiene. I don't know, maybe I could find some other words that I wouldn't want to use on camera. Born in 1956 and raised in upstate New York, Mr. M dreamed of being a dinosaur researcher before finding his true love, computers. He graduated from MIT in 1979 with a master's in computer science. Okay, 
card count commandments. Thou shalt not cheat. Thou shalt, however, take full advantage of all dealer and casino errors. Thou shalt not tip dealers. Card counting was almost certainly an obsession of mine from when I discovered it back in 1979. The typical card counter personality type has, I think, one preeminent feature, and that's a desire within them to beat the system. It's not as extreme as a criminal, but it's not conformist. When they discover this, I think it, it synergizes so that, oh my God, you know, I can beat the system legally and I can have fun doing it and this is just cool. Since the early 18th century, when blackjack was developed in France, its lure has always been its simplicity. To win, a player needs a card total that is higher than the dealers, but not over 21. In blackjack, when you're playing, you make decisions about how much to bet, how many hands to play, and how you play the hand. Card counting is based on the all-important fact that blackjack is not subject to the so-called law of independent tribes. In the game of roulette, each spin of the wheel is independent. If the number 32 comes up on one spin of the wheel, it has absolutely no effect on what number comes up on the next spin of the wheel. This is true as well in the game of craps. If the shooter rolls an eight, it has no effect on what number comes up on his next roll of the dice. Blackjack is different. If you hit on your hand and draw a 10, the deck of cards now has one less 10. The difference in blackjack, what makes it so special, is what happened in the past affects what's going to happen in the future. And just because one card has been removed from that pack is going to impact what happens to you on the next hand. So if you could find a way to keep track of the cards that have been dealt, you could make a pretty good guess about what cards are left in the deck. Well, the way card counting works is you keep track of the high cards. When there are more high cards left to be played, you have an advantage over the house. Mr. M has used this knowledge to fine-tune a remarkable method to beat the casinos. He first tried to beat the house back in 1979 when he founded the MIT Blackjack team. Throughout the 1980s, the team grew into a modestly profitable enterprise. The team disbanded around 1990 when most of its members got burned out. Blackjack teams tend not to last forever because people get burned out. People move on in their lives. People's ability to get along with each other and organize and feel they trust each other, that ebbs and flows too. Now it's 1992, and Mr. M has a plan to reform the team. But this time will be different. This time his vision is bigger, bolder. Mr. M wants to recruit, train, and build a highly disciplined team immune to burnout. A team that can outwit the casinos and bring in profits for many, many years. Well, my vision to restart the team was based on a number of things. First, that Foxwoods was going to open and we would have this potential way to train people. Second, there seemed to be a renaissance in gambling. New casinos were opening a lot more places to play than just Atlantic City and Las Vegas. To take full advantage of this new golden age of casino gambling, Mr. M needs a lot of players, at least two dozen, and a lot of money, a million dollars. He needs an operation on a very large scale, a scale never seen before. The timing has never been better. You know me, more money, more bets. But can an organization that big actually work? Why not? The bigger, the better. <laughs> we have the law of large numbers on our side. Look, all we gotta do is treat it like a real business, run it like a, uh, like a startup. We could do it right. Do an LP, get financing. Yeah, 1099s, we file our tax returns, a real organization right down the line. It could work. It could last. You in? A limited partnership formed with a singular goal, 
to outwit the casinos at their own game and make millions of dollars for many years to come. Well, it was a big deal. And in fact, it was, it was, it was a pretty profound thing to do. It was pretty ambitious. Uh, and if you want to get as big as he wanted to get, in my opinion, it was necessary. The idea was to form a legal entity, make the team be more legitimate, create a management structure that allowed for the training of larger numbers of players, and uh, raise a larger bankroll and make more money. Despite its meticulous design, Mr. M and his partners know the venture is not without risk. In addition to the usual team money disputes, strategy mistakes, and pure exhaustion, they will have to contend with a daunting, in-your-face adversary, the casinos. And their henchmen. Our business is to provide information to casinos all over the world about people who make a living cheating at gaming, or more recently, people who are known card counters. I was kind of like a gaming mortician. I had to put some people down. I said card counters are like pimples. Once you mash them, they come back more and more and more. Casinos have always employed some sort of method to combat undesirables, whether those be cheaters or counters. This was especially true starting in 1946, when New York gangster Bugsy Siegel used mob money to build the Flamingo Hotel, ushering in a new era of over-the-top Vegas-style glitz. With this new mob influence came new methods of detecting and taking care of casino undesirables. They've taken guys in the back and uh, threatened to cut their fingers off with pinking shears. They've burned people with cigarettes. By the late 1980s, most casinos of the world were owned by highly regulated public companies and were run like any other big business. With this increased sophistication came professional security operations, organized databases of undesirables, and lots of cameras. The typical, at least mega resort in Las Vegas now has thousand, if not more, cameras throughout the casino. They can track every movement you make from the minute you set on the property till the time you go to bed in your room from, till the time you leave. All of this information is fed into a central command that looks like a NASA space center. Many casinos don't distinguish between a cheater and a card counter. So they, they really go on DEFCON 4 when they see somebody they suspect may be doing something. Although crafty and secretive, card counting is not cheating. Card counting is simply playing intelligently. Cheating is breaking the rules and manipulating the game to your advantage illegally. It's not illegal. They're not cheating. They're using their brains to solve a problem. We're just using our heads. I mean. We're just doing what the rules say. We're given cards, the dealer's given cards. All we're doing is deciding whether to take more cards or not, and how much to bet. That's it! Although card counting is perfectly legal, casinos view it as an undesirable activity. If they catch you doing it, they can, as a private business, permanently bar you from entering their premises. This sets up the ultimate cat and mouse game, card counter versus casino and it raises the stakes for Mr. M and his budding venture. So you're trying to stay invisible while at the same time bet as much money as humanly possible out there. So you're ducking, you're sneaking around, you're coming out of your cubby hole, you go out and you get the cheese, and you take it, and you scurry off to the next place, hopefully before they snap the trap on you. In March 1992, an elaborate business plan is drawn up, and legal papers are filed to register the new limited partnership. Strategic Investments LP. The listed partners are Mr. M, Bill, and John. Its stated goal is to apply mathematical analyses to win at the game of blackjack. The venture is described as an ongoing enterprise that will last at least till the end of the decade. I think it drew immediate interest from me as an investor, from um, just themselves, between Bill, Mr. M, and John, they were able to get quite a bit of the investment capital. Financial split is a crucial factor in the success of any blackjack team. It has to be fair.
Strategic investments was structured a little differently from past blackjack teams. There was more money paid to management in strategic investments on the basis of there being more management and better management and more training needed. With the strategic investments venture off and running, Mr. M and his partners turn to recruitment. The ideal recruit for strategic investments would be somebody who, first of all, had some degree of intelligence. Secondly, you had to be sufficiently focused and diligent to actually practice to the point where the simple tasks that you have to perform are performed perfectly. You want people that want to make money. You need somebody that's aggressive, um, that isn't afraid to go, isn't going to freeze in a casino. But who among these brilliant, industrious students has the right stuff? Some are recruited by word of mouth. Tales of over-the-top casino comps, suites, limos, front row show tickets, big bank rolls, the Vegas life are an inducement for some. I think it was what I call an, an enjoyable byproduct of playing. Katie, an engineering major at MIT, is familiar with the legend of the team and one of the few female recruits. It just really appealed to me, the idea that you could beat the casino. The casino always seemed like such an unfair enterprise taking advantage of people's weaknesses. Some recruits are seduced by flyers. There were flyers around about, you know, uh, need money, uh, tuition short, uh, learn to play blackjack. It's the early spring of 1992 when Semyon Dukach is turned on to the blackjack team. A Russian immigrant who grew up in Houston, Semyon is an MIT student studying computer science. I was walking down the hallway and I saw a poster about the MIT Blackjack team. I have already been thinking about Blackjack. I was very excited. I thought this was a great opportunity for me to meet people who are really doing something that I had dreamed about. And so one night in April 1992, a meeting begins that will change the organized playing of Blackjack forever. It is the launch of strategic investments. I arrived in the room at building two room 143 at the time specified on the poster and I saw Mr. Rem as well as perhaps 30 or 40 MIT students and he was telling them about how they could make money playing blackjack. By this time I had gotten it down pretty well. I started off explaining the history of card counting, the fact that you could both theoretically and practically beat the game. This is all governed by the law of large numbers. It works. I mean, if you were to go to a casino and make dozens of trips over the next year, you might win a tremendous amount of money, but you might lose a lot of money. That's just the math of the game. But if you played as part of a team, if you had 10, 20, 30 people doing it all together, the chances are great that you'd win a tremendous amount of money and the chances are almost nil that you would lose any money. That's why my promise is not a scam. That's why we can beat the casinos, as we have been doing for almost a decade now. Yeah, question? I had actually raised my hand and I had asked Mr. M uh, whether they employed shuffle tracking techniques in addition to simple card counting. Do you guys just use high-low counting or do you actually use non-random shuffling techniques, front-loading, spooking? <laughs> so you've been reading a little bit on the, on the subject. Well, let me just say this for right now. Uh, we, uh, we do everything that you've ever heard of and a lot of things that you haven't. Stick around, you'll, you'll, you'll learn it all. Mr. M made an inspirational presentation that evening and he got a lot of these kids excited about join, joining the MIT Blackjack team. Mr. M was inspiring to a nerd. I mean, you know, I'm a nerd, okay? And so the kind of stuff that he wanted to do is the kind of stuff that I was into. So I had no idea if I was going to make money or not, but, I mean, the promise was, uh, yeah, the investors were putting up all the money, I didn't have to put up a dime, and I mean, that, that definitely made all the difference. These guys are serious, this is MIT, smart people. Uh, really beating the casinos. I'd like to get involved, I'd like to get good at it, and I'd like to take it seriously. Let me say this. Uh, we to take it seriously, the recruits must submit to a grueling training schedule, hours a day for up to six months, capped by the infamous checkout stress test. 
thou shalt always check out before playing, or thou shalt forfeit thy expectation for the entire trip. During the training period, Mr. M and his partners will teach Semyon, Dukach, Katie, and the other recruits the secret card counting techniques that will strike fear in the hearts of casino managers. Techniques designed to liberate millions of dollars in cash and comps from the casinos. Techniques that will validate Mr. M's reputation and make his MIT Blackjack team world famous. All right, it's got to get like you're not even thinking about it anymore. Roger up, let's go. Strategic investments, the limited partnership set up to run the biggest, best organized MIT Blackjack team ever, is kicking into gear. So the 10% bonus pool for the players will be paid in direct proportion to your actual winnings. An impressive sum. Over a half million dollars has been raised to date as stake for the venture. With a true count of six, your expected value is 2.5%. But now you have to bring in your certainty equivalent. Mr. Rem's recruits are now ready to discover the extraordinary secrets of card counting. Basic strategy, the high-low count, and team play. The variance in the count of X decks from a total of D is well approximated by 40 times 1 minus X over D. Card counting was just theory until 1958 when a young, methodical UCLA math professor read an obscure technical paper. The name of the paper was Optimum Strategy in Blackjack. The name of the professor? Edward O. Thorpe, card counting's soon-to-be founding father. After a professor at uh, UCLA showed me the uh, Optimum Strategy at Blackjack paper, I decided to try it out in Las Vegas. So I risked 10 silver dollars, lost most of them, but learned a lot. And that got me focused on thinking about the paper more carefully. And that's what led to my analysis. In 1959, Thorpe moved east to MIT and fine-tuned his method. I was fortunate because the era of high-speed computers had just started. The IBM 704 was one of the early, really good computers. Hunched till the wee hours over MIT's IBM 704, Thorpe came up with a series of refinements to the system which he called basic strategy. Basic strategy is the correct way to play every possible blackjack hand. Every hand has an absolutely correct way. If you have 14 and the dealer has a 7, you should hit that. If you have 14 and the dealer has a 5, you should stand that. These are not my opinions, these are mathematical facts. And basic strategy is the set of all those such mathematically correct decisions. Basic strategy does not guarantee that Semyon and the rest of the MIT team will win every hand they play. It does guarantee that over time, with disciplined use, the strategy will dramatically increase their chances of winning. In January 1961, Thorpe gave a talk at a meeting of the American Mathematical Society. It was called Fortune's Formula, a winning strategy for blackjack. And in it, I explained that you could make $3,200 a day if you followed uh, the system that I had uh, put forward. For the first time, a doctor of mathematics, instead of doctor of hustling and doctor of scheming and a magician, dove into blackjack and figured out a way that smart guys can beat the game. Thorpe became an overnight sensation, appearing in countless newspaper and magazine articles. The publicity was something strange and a little bit alien to me, something I wasn't wholly comfortable with, and something that I didn't really seek out. It more or less just happened. In April 1962, Thorpe traveled to Nevada to test his system. And my forecast on this trip was that if I went through this sequence that I described, that we could produce about a $10,000 profit on the initial $10,000 bankroll. In fact, when all smoke cleared, we had a profit of $11,000, which is pretty close to the forecast. Thorpe wrote about his method in the revolutionary Beat the Dealer, which would become the best-selling book ever written on the subject, the Bible for card counters, including the MIT blackjack team. Before he came along with Beat the Dealer, dice was far and away the biggest game in legal casinos. And for the first time ever, 
people with high self-esteem started coming into casinos. Casinos have started attracting smart guys instead of wise guys. Cambridge, Massachusetts, May 1992. Mr. M's recruits have memorized the basic strategy chart. Essentially the same chart first published in Thorpe's Beat the Dealer 30 years before. They can now play blackjack literally by the book. Now it's time to learn how to bet. For that, they have to learn the high-low card counting technique. Card counting boils down to two simple rules. When there are more big cards left in the deck, you bet more. When there are fewer big cards left in the deck, you bet less. And we'll start off with a two, three, four, five, and a six. Those are called plus ones. That means every time I see one of those, there are more big cards in the deck, and the more big cards there are means I'm going to get more black jacks, the dealer's going to bust more, and I'm going to win more double downs. Over here we have ten, jack, queen, king, ace. That tells me that every time I see one of those, there are more little cards in the deck, and the more little cards there are means the dealer is going to bust fewer times. And we have what are known as the neutral cards, the sevens, eights, and nines. They mean nothing. So high cards are good for the player, and low cards are bad. If you could then estimate how many of each type remains in the deck, or decks in the case of a multi-deck shoe, you would know when to bet the maximum and when to bet the minimum. The secret is to keep a running count as the cards are dealt. When we start off counting, we start off with zero. So let's take a look. We have a plus one and a minus one equals zero. We have a minus one and a plus one equals zero. We go plus one, plus two. Now we're at plus two. That means nothing. We get another little card. That takes us to plus three. That tells me it's time to start putting some money out on the table. What I'm really looking for is a plus five or a plus ten, and I get as much money on the table as I think I can get away with. It's not hard to learn. It's hard to learn to do without mistakes. I could teach a piece of firewood how to count cards if, if, if that piece of firewood could concentrate. It's all about concentration. That's the whole game. But the game doesn't end with just the high-low count. That's just the starting point. Here's what you have to remember. Every time the same. Right? And watch this. Watch this. Again. Like that. Okay. Good. The expected value is three, so what are our options here? Remember, you have to watch the card just before the cut. Just like that, right? We're following the ace. Following the ace. All right. Everybody? As Semyon, Katie, and the other recruits progress, they are exposed to more advanced techniques. After you learned how to count the cards, after you learned how to analyze how much of the deck is left, you had to memorize these charts that told you how to change your bet, when to raise, what to raise it to, how to change your play, because your play changes based on the count as well. You had to memorize when to double down, when to split, all the things that are familiar to regular blackjack players, but they had very specific rules on when to make these sort of decisions and you had to memorize it all perfectly to the point where you would make no mistakes, not, not a single mistake, because a single mistake an hour means you're going to be betting at the wrong time and you can lose a lot of money that way. It got to the point where if I saw a blackjack table full of cards spread out on it, within a second or two I would know what the count is without being conscious of thinking about it. We're following the ace. More teacher than actual player, Mr. M is responsible for drilling the hundreds of rules into the heads of the recruits. He didn't look like somebody you'd imagine leading, but, but um, he was a pretty good leader. He also was a really good trainer. And I also think Mr. M, although he never showed it, I think he really cared about succeeding in, in, um, in front of his peers. With basic strategy, high-low counting, and even a few advanced techniques under their belts, the recruits have to master the final, most nuanced part of card counting, team play. Team play is a lot of fun because you, with some people you like, you have camaraderie. Card counters are the gamblers who play for big bucks and constantly adjust their betting levels up and down, a method which draws attention to itself. If they recognize a known card counter, they will ask him to leave. Most places are very polite about it. Some casinos still react a little more harshly and abuse the people verbally. Um, some casinos get even worse and they back room you. They take you in the back, threaten to arrest you. The ability to play undetected is a major challenge for the team. If they're quickly made by the casino bosses, the team could lose a fortune, collapse, and prove an embarrassment for Mr. M. To avoid detection, the MIT team employs a division of labor. 
different players have different roles. Spotters are members of the team who watch blackjack games in progress, count the cards, and when there's a good situation, a high count, they signal somebody to come in and sit down and bet. When the count at a particular table gets high, that is when the count is favorable for the player, the spotters signal in the so-called gorilla, or big player. The big player would slide into the table, bet $10,000 a hand until the cards were no longer good, then get the signal and leave. From the casino's perspective, you have a bunch of kids just playing $10 a hand, never raising their bet, and then you have one big player paying $10,000 a hand all night, and you know, this is the way he plays, so from the casino's point of view, there's no card counting going on. After months of fanatical training, Semyon, Katie, and the rest of Mr. M's recruits are ready for the ultimate test. You'd have to be practice, 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 and then, by the way, you also have to practice. The test, which will determine who can join Mr. M's team. It's a grueling rite of passage, which culminates in actual casino action. The checkout. Each and every one of them is brilliant. They're all smart people. It's one thing to know how to card count in the privacy of a dorm room. It's quite another to do it in the intensity of a crowded casino. Think about it. You sit down to play at a busy table in a major casino with hundreds of basic strategy combinations primed and ready in your mind. Then you scan the table taking note of every single card dealt while applying the high-low counting method. Zero, plus one, plus two, plus one. Don't forget to watch for signals from other team members amidst the casino clatter. Change, 300. Cigarette, cigarette. Let's go, coming out. And watch out for the dozens of casino managers who'd love to have a little chat with you. And the minute you walk in there, you've got dealers that are trying to pick you off, floorman trying to pick you off, pit bosses trying to pick you off, shift bosses and casino managers, and the guys up in surveillance. So you've got an army of literally hundreds of people out there, and you're it. So you've got to be cool under all circumstances. Mr. M's dream of creating the biggest, best organized MIT blackjack team to outwit the casinos for generations is coming true. He and his partners have created an organization, raised a million dollars, and trained over two dozen recruits. It's now time for the recruits to prove they can handle the heat. The tests that you had to pass were called checkouts. The, the tests that you had to pass were very rigorous. You know, our team, we wanted to be sure people reached a very high standard of play. You just have to check out. I mean, we have to feel confident before we give you money. How do we know you won't crash and burn? You had to pass it to be a full member of the team to get full credit for things that you did. During the checkout, everyone felt a lot of pressure. Uh, like an exam, like a test where you have to perform. The player would have to count the cards, calculate the bets, um, keep track that they weren't getting ripped off when, when they get paid off on the bets. Basically what it consisted of was playing through ten shoes um, all the way through and in those ten shoes you could make um, a very limited number of counting mistakes. If I asked you the count and the count was really three and you said seven, that's an automatic flunk. Accurately keeping track of the count is the easy part of the checkout test. It is the test-taking atmosphere that measures what the recruits are really made of. We need another arm. Preferably <laughs> We would try and distract them. We would deal as fast as we possibly could. We would, we would cause disruptions. They're paying you off wrong. They're walking around, you know, trying to sell you cigarettes. Cocktail waitresses coming over. You're trying to simulate the kind of stress that you feel in the casino. Mr. M was definitely motivated by using his knowledge to beat casinos and more so by sharing his knowledge with others, with other like-minded people in a team environment. Okay, okay, okay. My Russian friend, what's the count? Um, plus five? Plus four. It's close. 
But the casino beats us if we're only close. Let's do it again. Minus three, minus four, minus five, minus four, minus three, minus two. Yes, yes. Go down. Go down. Go down. Yeah. Stop! What's the count? Give me the count! Um, plus two. Plus four! Come on! I shorted your payoff on the last hand. This is almost... It was almost as difficult as doing my PhD. And the idea was that if they could get through that, which was actually harder than what they were faced with in the casino environment, then they would be okay in the real casino. When you take your driver's test as a kid, remember that feeling when you took a driver's test? If you don't remember to make the three-point turn in the right way or parallel park in the right way, you don't get your license. And all those months of training go down the tube. I would say that's a similar sort of feeling. Chase is on the board. Chase. Despite best efforts at training, the checkout test is rarely a slam dunk. Oh, absolutely. Everybody failed, in fact. I mean, I don't think there's a single person who ever passed the test the first time. Throughout the spring and early summer of 1992, the recruits continue to train and check out with increasing intensity. Get that up. Minus three. Seven. All right. Right on the money. What's the count? What's the freaking count? Plus eight. And since the certainty correlate is plus five, I'm splitting my chance. You nailed it. Oh! I think I was one of the first people who, who quickly, on my first attempt, passed the full checkout because I was motivated by the pressure. I just, I needed that environment in order to give it the seriousness and attention that it deserved. Semyon, Dan, Katie, and all who passed the checkouts are now invited to practice their skills with real money in a real casino. For that, they travel a quick two hours southwest of Foxwoods, the Connecticut Indian Casino that first sparked Mr. M's vision to restart the team a few months back. When we were training new players at Foxwoods, the goal was to introduce them to real casino play in a stepped way where their skills would advance under the eye of an experienced player, whether that meant playing low, typically low stakes, small amounts of money, and we test different kinds of skills and ease them into the, the real casino experience. There was probably eight or nine of us in various levels of checkoutedness. I think Mr. M gave me a thousand bucks and said, Go play some nickels. Don't bet any more than $5. It was just to go get some casino experience, play for the lowest limits you can, and uh, I was already hooked at that point, but it was like, wow, this is great. I get to gamble, and it's even my money, you know? On most of the training runs, Mr. M, who was often uncomfortable at the tables, stands watch behind the recruits. He makes sure they don't commit any basic strategy mistakes, that they keep track of the count and bet in accordance with the team rules. Mr. M was a very nervous guy, and he was always very worried that something might go wrong, and he hovered over the players looking, looking fidgety a lot of the time. Thou shalt believe in the law of large numbers. Thou shalt believe that expectations add. Thou shalt not act according to thy hunches or impressions of lucky streaks. So we were able to play a lot, and most of us, most of the time, were able to win. And that was fun. And then we got to enjoy the comps right away. Even before we were fully trained, we started getting some Foxwoods points, and we could have some rooms and bottles of wine and dinners. And that was nice. During these on-site training sessions, not every recruit gets to feast on the spoils of beating the house. I'm pretty sure that I lost the second most of anybody associated with the team during their checkout. Over the course of my checkout and casino checkout time, I lost something like $17,000, where, you know, you're supposed to be playing a winning game, um, and I think I was playing a winning game, but I got clocked. As long as the recruits are playing and betting correctly, they are considered good players. In the short term, there can be fluctuations up and down. But over time, the law of large numbers predicts the method will win out. After several more weeks of checkouts and trips to Foxwoods, by July 1992, training is complete. Over a dozen recruits are now official members of the MIT Blackjack team. You're always proud when somebody 
asked us to check out. I mean, it was quite a camaraderie experience, sort of, when somebody finally did manage to, to pass the check out. And if you had spent a lot of time with them practicing, of course, you, you were most proud of, of that. Phase one of Strategic Investment's mission is complete. Phase two, with the highest of stakes, is ready to begin. The battlefield? The town discovered by a Mexican trader in 1829. Settled by Mormons in 1855 and overrun by the mob in 1946. The town that practically celebrates the cat and mouse game between card counters and casinos. Mr. M's MIT team is on its way to Sin City, Las Vegas. It is Thursday afternoon. The MIT campus hums with sleep-deprived students getting ready for the upcoming weekend of study. Plasma physics, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence are all on the agenda. But not for MIT graduate student Semyon Dukac. He is preparing for his first trip to Las Vegas as a full-fledged member of the MIT Blackjack team. Money was always transported on your person. One of the strictest team rules was that you never, ever let money and you be physically separated. That was the only way you could really get money through the security checkpoints at the airport. Now, Ben and John and Dan will all meet you at the Mirage Volcano at okay. 10. Mm -hmm. 10. Uh, right. Kate will definitely be there as well. Okay, all right. good. Now, if anybody in the casino is suspicious and they come up to you, you go to the door and you get out. You don't yes. talk to them. You don't, you don't argue with them. You don't try and cash in your chips. You just get out. I got it. Remember, no drinking. Remind there's never to drink, never to get too distracted, uh, to be very focused, to play well, etc. Got it. Mr. M was like an old grandmother to the players to some extent, always worrying about everything. And now, on this Thursday in September 1992, Semyon heads to Boston's Logan Airport to catch an America West flight to Las Vegas. He's ready to test his skills against the big boys. On my first trip to Vegas, I believe I actually flew out alone and I met some people there. I remember that I had a heavy leather jacket with about $150,000 in cash in the pocket, which was maybe very bulky and even heavier still. You go to log and you have to go through security, you have to make sure they don't notice all this money and delay your flight. Every time the plane approaches the runway in the Las Vegas airport, and you see the bright lights of the city, the tall buildings, a certain excitement. Uh, gets built up. For a new player, it's the culture shock immediately. I mean, you're going from an MIT campus to Las Vegas. You want to play, you want to do something, because simply because we prepared for a long time, and this was the big opportunity, and here we were, and anything was possible. As instructed, Semyon Dukac arrives at the Mirage Volcano to meet up with a half dozen team members. Time passes. He realizes not all is going as planned. The people I was supposed to meet I were late, so I, I recall at some point walking around the volcano at the Mirage uh, in a circle again and again, <laughs> sweating more and more, <laughs> trying to find these people. As he waits for the team, Semyon knows he has never been more ready to beat the house. He also knows he is not the first to come to Vegas with a big dream. From its early days in the 1930s, Vegas has been a magnet for grifters, hustlers, skimmers, cheaters, and later, card counters. All shared a simple mission, to bring down the house. No game was immune. Slots had been attacked by slugs, screwdrivers, coins with strings attached. Crafts has long been plagued by cheaters' dice that are shaved, weighted, or magnetized. And then there's the card game, the holy shrine of the cheat. People have been marking cards so many ways, from grease paints to lipsticks. They use sand on their fingernails. They bend cards. They nick cards. They drop them into their coffee. They drop them into alcohol so it'll swell the edges of the cards. 
More recently, blackjack cheats have tried using hidden computers to help them keep track of the game. The most popular blackjack computer is a shoe computer. They used to be legal. They're no longer legal. You would literally type with your toes, and this computer would tell you what the odds were of winning. Smart guys are always ahead of the curve. But now, the smart guys are trying to legally outwit the casinos, armed with nothing but their brains. It's around midnight, and after wandering the strip for over an hour, Semyon finally bumps into a team member, Katie. I ended up taking a later flight than I was originally planning to. I'm sure Semyon was completely stressed out about the situation. They quickly come up with a plan. going to play this Russian arms dealer and I was going to play his um, his girlfriend. Those were our two roles. He was definitely going to be the one that was going to put out uh, the big bucks. All right, let's go do it. Yeah. <laughs> the bathroom it's just off to your right thanks when the cards turn bad i mean you try to send the person betting a lot of money away oh uh give us some quarters oh. all right i'll be back baby i'll go easy on you semi could just leave the table and i could just sit there keep betting the minimum that i was betting 25 dollars until the cards turn nice again good luck New York. Oh, really? I have cousins there. It's really nice. We love it. We could come out of the bathroom and uh, you know look over the table, see whether you know I was signaling that it was worth sitting down again. We'd be resting on one hand would mean, you know, that the table is pretty good, and if you were resting on the other hand, it meant, you know, it was very good. And if you had both hands up, it meant, you know, this is the best shoe we're going to see all weekend, and I hope you get over here as soon as possible. So how have things been going for you? Uh, okay, I guess. Let's have some fun. Yeah. Feel lucky. With that type of action, I'd love to offer you a junior suite in our hotel. Sure. How about a late steak dinner? That would be nice. Okay, great. Your name, please? Uh, Nikolai Nogo. Beating the house feels great on a deep psychological level. It's us against them. You can't believe that you're getting away with this at all. Everything is behind them. Surveillance teams, uh, the whole industry. And we are just a few kids half the age, and we go in there, and we beat them, and they don't even realize it. That's a good feeling. Oh, oh sweet. 
With a series of trips to Foxwoods and now to Las Vegas, Mr. M's dream of building an MIT blackjack team for the ages is ramping up quickly. We were betting 5,000 a hand. We did pretty well for the first run. That first trip, I remember, really knocked our socks off just because we won so much money. And I believe I won 100,000 on that trip, which was a good one. But in the world of card counting, luck can change on a dime. Especially when you've got an army of people doing everything possible to shut you down. Grand. The pit boss can't figure his game. And other guys too. Because they're not playing straight high low. Right now all I know is they're from New England and they're smart as hell. A few more weeks I'll make their game and I'll put them out of business. Presidential power passes from Bush to Clinton. There is nothing wrong with America. The Dallas Cowboys are dominating the Super Bowls. Nirvana is exploding onto the music scene. And the MIT Blackjack team is on a roll. Well, the team's routine, basically, was you would fly on Friday from Boston to Las Vegas. You would gamble straight for 48 hours, no drinking, no partying. And then Sunday night, you would party until you caught the red eye back to Boston. And then you'd hand off the money to whoever was responsible for getting it, and you'd go back to being a student. In between the weekend trips, team members are required to fill out a range of forms. Strategic Investments was very thorough about the paperwork that we'd fill out um, at the end of a trip. You'd need to remember basically how many shoes you'd counted and what the conditions were, how many other players, and then certainly your money totals. All playing and betting data is fed into a computer for later analysis. That information would then get used to determine how much you would get paid for your playing time. Players earn a modest salary for their playtime and hope that their cut of the profits will add up. Profits are outlined in quarterly statements which highlight wins, losses, and various expenses. As Semyon, Dan, and Katie fine-tune their skills throughout 1993, their targets widen. To avoid spending too much time in any one casino and risk getting caught and ejected, the team rotates its victims. You'd go out to Vegas or to one of the riverboat casinos of Atlantic City, sometimes to the Caribbean, and occasionally to Europe. <laughs> All right, this is 10, 20, and 30. Then you'd come back. There we debrief. Go. And I have more coming. And you'll balance all the numbers and make sure all the money is in the right place and prepare for the next trip. Hundreds of hands a day, thousands of hands a weekend. Mr. M's blackjack machine has finally hit its stride. Yes! Yes! team members are increasingly successful at balancing their losses with giant wins. <laughs> what time are you leaving? Each remembers the single most important characteristic of a winning player, getting the money out when you have the advantage. Late one Saturday night, Semyon is the big player. Katie and Dan are spotted. The count is an amazing plus 15. 10, 15, deal or break. Oh. 
Wanna let that ride? Let's ride, baby. Good luck. Semyon presses his bet, putting $75,000 on the line. Shows a three, eight, 19, 19, and 18. Six, 10, 14. Deal of race. $75,000 profit in 12 seconds. By June 1st, 1993, the team is on fire, with winnings totaling $439,952. Guys, I just want to say we're doing great. Here's to getting the money out. <laughs> yeah! I think that when strategic investments took off and we were up you know, a considerable amount of money. For a lot of people, it was a feeling of being part of something just huge and enormous and on this rocket ride. Students in sweaters during the week. High rollers in silk shirts and suits on the weekend. For some, a secret life. Their families didn't know, their girlfriends didn't know, certainly the professors didn't know. They were basically in Boston, they were the best students, you know, at MIT, they were good kids. And in Vegas, they were the top gamblers. You get back Monday and it's like, well, what'd you do this weekend? You know, it's hard to know where to start, you know. The life is seductive, no doubt about it. Even to straight and narrow MIT nerds. As high rollers or whales, they are indulged wherever they go. Well, because of the whole host system in Vegas and how whales are treated like gods there, they would have front row seats to everything there is in Vegas. They would have suites. Some of these suites would have swimming pools in them, jacuzzis in them. There would be steaks waiting for them when they arrived. They'll give you what's called an RFB comp, um, room, food, and beverage. So, um, you know, they'll give you a room for free. They'll give you access to all the gourmet restaurants and room service and, of course, all the alcohol that you want to drink. <laughs> So I got uh, a private airplane to take me from New York. And I also got a plane once to take me into the Grand Canyon where I just demanded that they give me a four-seater plane of the pilot. I got all my birthday presents at Foxwoods. I probably took a total of maybe thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of comps out of out of Foxwoods over the years. But yeah, I mean the most outrageous comp I think I ever heard of was one of the people who managed to get his wedding comp at Caesar's Palace. <laughs> But thanks to expected mathematical variance, the team's good fortune is sometimes balanced by the unfortunate. Maybe in 10 minutes, in five, during half a shoot, the count went up very high, unusually high, and so I was betting two hands of 10,000, and I managed to lose a bunch of hands in a row. Semyon loses $150,000 in a few short minutes. Worst of all, he runs out of chips. Although he has more cash in his pockets, he can't buy more than $30,000 in chips without showing ID. That's a problem since he's playing under an alias. He realizes he has no choice. He has to leave the table and the casino. The really frustrating thing was running out in the middle of the shoe, because when you bet a lot, it means that the shoe is particularly good. And by leaving in the middle, you're actually walking away from a big advantage, an unusually big advantage. And that's frustrating. Thou shalt not speak ill of thy fellow losing player, except in good humor and jest. While the first crop of players churns out trips to Vegas, AC, Foxwoods, the Caribbean, and Europe, Mr. M and his partners continue to recruit and train new players. Izzy and Ben dropped out. They were complaining about the profit splits of the players. Yeah, small potatoes. Everything's running like clockwork now, anyhow. So uh, I guess it's time for a recruitment drive. Just to get the money out. <laughs> Sweet. With over three dozen players outwitting the casinos practically at will, Strategic Investments has now won a total of $888,560. Could the venture become a long-term cash cow, proving that a well-run blackjack team can last? Yeah, I think in mid-93, Mr. M felt like he was well on his way to the vision of the biggest, boldest team ever. 
Oh, I was counting my money, certainly. <laughs> I mean, and there was a certain amount of satisfaction and pride at having put together and, and built the whole thing. But in the months ahead, as the team increases its winnings, it also increases something else. It's profile. Look what a little birdie dropped on me. What's this? <laughs> manual. MIT manual. There's a guy on uh, five spot, BJ3. I think he's moving his money with the count. Sir, I need you to step away from the table. It's the summer of 1993, and the MIT Blackjack team is a money machine with almost a million dollars in profits. It just feels awesome. It's the same feeling that you get when, when your team wins. Mr. M and his partners have created a tightly run business with over 40 active players. We got it all set up. It really seems to be working. You know, this could go on for years. Yeah, this is great. But as any Vegas gambler will tell you, lady luck can be fickle and not very ladylike. Basically, you can't do this forever. After a certain amount of time, the casinos figure out that you're not just a regular high roller. You become extremely attuned to the attitudes and the mannerisms of the supervisory personnel in the pits. You can tell when their behavior has gone from, oh, here's a gambler, to, wait a minute, is this guy doing something? You definitely get the, the feeling of the whole cat and mouse kind of game with the casino. Um, you know, you're trying your hardest not to notice when they're, you know, talking to each other and they're on the phone, and they're at, acting agitated. We sort of sensed and, and, and got information to the effect that we were a hot item with these people, that, that we were being followed more intensely. But exactly who is following them? They had people like this man, the silver-haired man, that would uh, travel around to the different casinos. One of them was a tall guy with silver hair. Yes, I'm that silver-haired man that chased those kids from MIT around this town for four to five years. As the team would discover years later, the silver-haired man was Andy Anderson. I'm not an expert in anything in gaming, but what I am an expert in is chasing faces. A detective who at the time works for Las Vegas-based Griffin Investigations. Griffin Investigations has been in business since 1967. Then we have provided casinos with information about people who make a living cheating at gaming, and more recently, people who are known card counters, anybody who's of interest to the casinos, who are our clients. The shadowy kids winning big money in casinos around the world have become the focus of a serious investigation. When you start getting into the organized group and you're wanting to win hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're taking comps from hotels and you're getting tickets to shows and you're getting airfare, um, casinos are in the business of making money and they have stockholders. They have to report to those stockholders. And so when the casino is losing money, they start looking around to find out why and where. Why can they walk into a casino, sit out, on, sit out on a table, and beat their percentage almost each and every time? Are they cheating? Well, no, we proved no. They're not cheating. So therefore, what are they doing? Where did they come from? Where did they get their money? We played with this guy down on the riverboat. These two were a pair at the DI last week. I studied facial features. She's a floater. I studied body movement. I studied habits. Yeah, that's the one. I took a bunch of mug shots that I used to carry around every night in the trunk of my car. Every time I saw somebody in a casino, huh, how did I do? I'd run out to my trunk of my car, and I'd pull out this mug book, and I'd say, oh, this guy is this, uh, 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 he runs with this guy. He's the ringleader. And oh, he's the key guy. And then we have briefings, and we exchange information, exchange photographs, and whatever shift you worked on, you had to brief the next shift about what was going on. And essentially, they begin to sort of connect the big players to the spotters. And once you do that, you can sort of figure out the team. 
Thou shalt not take unnecessary risks. Thou shalt not carry large amounts of money alone. Thou shalt not allow someone to carry large amounts of money alone. I'm sure. You 100% sure? Damn right. It's Semyon Dukas, the Russian. Key member of the team. Let's tap him. This pit five? <laughs> I need you to step away from the table. Why? What for? Your play is too good for us. We need you to go somewhere else. Just letting off some steam, playing a couple of hands. Sir, I really need you to follow me in my office right now. We can discuss this in private. Oh, thanks. I'll just grab my chips and leave. No, sir. I really need you to come to my office. Right this way. Rack up the chips. I hereby advise you that you are trespassing. If you do not leave this property immediately, you will be subject to arrest under Nevada Trespass Act 207.2. If you come in this casino again, we'll have you arrested immediately. Do you understand the severity and the possible penalties that can result? Or do you want me to go over it again? Okay, I got it. I'd like to go now. Semyon Dukac has officially been barred from his first casino. He will never return. Unfortunately, he will not be alone. In the coming weeks, more and more team members will have wild run-ins with the casino bosses. Hey Jack, there's a guy on uh, five spot BJ3. And before long, the team will face the ultimate challenge. It's not our money. You know, we'll try to win, but sometimes you lose. Tense encounters, ejections, back rooming. Hey Jack, there's a guy on uh, five spot BJ3. I think he's moving his money with the count. Would you mind clocking him and let me know what you think? Throughout the summer and into the fall of 1993, the MIT Blackjack team has its share of run-ins with the casino bosses. I had $140,000 in cash on me, and they're telling me to empty this out on the table. And you should have seen these guys. As I was emptying this money out, their eyes are getting bigger and bigger. And one of them said, you know, you could buy a house with us. And of course, I live in Massachusetts, and where you can't buy a house for 40, even then you couldn't buy a house for $140,000. But like an idiot, my response was, yeah, maybe your house. <laughs> it seemed like so much. Run-ins on foreign soil can be a bit scarier. Semyon and his team are once confronted in Europe, in the storied casino of Monte Carlo. We got dragged to the police station. And they started just scaring us, separating us into rooms, intimidating, drilling, searching the car, and saying, they were telling us that car counting is illegal in Monte Carlo. Even team founder Mr. M is not immune to confrontation with casino executives. Once, in 1993, he, Dan, and a few other players head down to St. Martin for a little action. They immediately start winning. We were up like $50,000 maybe after a day, and this was like more action than they had ever seen in their lives. And they got more and more freaked out. Um, by Saturday evening, um, they decided that we were using computers. And they hauled us into this back room, and asked us to take off our shirts and our shoes because they were looking for computers. Yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> Why not? I don't have a computer on me. <laughs> go ahead. This can only result in your ultimate embarrassment. <laughs> and he decided to throw a big hairy fit. So off comes his shirt, off comes his shoes, off comes his drawers. I mean, big hairy fit is actually pretty appropriate. Just then our casino host walks in, this gorgeous 25-year-old babe, takes one look at him, turns straight around, and goes out the other way. Um, it, it was hilarious. Yeah, it was bizarre. It was just 
Just totally bizarre. This is the first story I'm going to tell my grandchildren. This is, I mean, this is really what I was in the thing for. The entire premise of the MIT blackjack team, the law of large numbers, is to keep playing a lot. And yet as time goes by, they increasingly find themselves in hot water. They basically were just getting booted all over the place, you know, in the whole country, Atlantic City, everywhere. And they realized pretty much the team had been made. To help casinos ID the team, surveillance photos of team members are added to the infamous Griffin Book. It is distributed to casinos worldwide. Well, we had always known about the Griffin Book and the fact that we were in it. I was in the Griffin Book under a large number of aliases, I'm told. They always put out pictures in the book whenever they could. They should report as to our actual trip. So sometimes when we're in Vegas, an instant Griffin report would come out by fax to so a bunch of their subscriber member casinos saying, these are the players who are playing right now. They referred to me as the darling of Las Vegas. Simon the Russian struck a nerve. First of all, he came out of nowhere. And when he came out, he had lots of money. He did put effort and put a lot of work into what he was become. He claimed he was a Russian gun dealer. Give me a break. A 20-some-year-old Russian gun dealer? They, all these more red flags should have went up and you could count a stick up. But no, why didn't they go up? Because he didn't come with guns, he came with cash. After the faces are made, it isn't long before the rest of the puzzle comes together. We found a lot of similarities, the similarities being that they all had the Cambridge, Massachusetts or some area nearby as an address. Although the team uses aliases, some members carelessly use Cambridge addresses to register for comps. As it turns out, a dead giveaway. Did I ever use the Amate yearbook to check on faces? The answer is, of course, I did. Because once we realized they came from MIT, to me, this was elementary. The team's trademark, meticulous organization, inadvertently provides other clues. They're not only too smart, but they wrote manuals and books. Well, once they put it on the paper, they brought it with them. Some of them was smart, some of them wasn't smart. So therefore, next thing you know, you find a manual. It says they were going to do this, or this, and then this, this, and they broke it down. With their faces becoming more well-known by casinos every day, the team tries to fight back by getting new ones. Essentially, they started to change their look in every casino they were at, and they would have a variety of personas, different disguises and characters around those disguises to play at different casinos. Oh, within months, if not weeks, of entering a casino, I had resorted to some disguises. At one time, uh, we, we had uh, John dressed up as a woman. Another time, uh, I think he, he was a woman and a nurse, and I was a, a guy in a wheelchair. This beard, I originally grew this beard when I was playing blackjack to change my appearance, make me look a little older, make me look different. I bought this watch uh, to wear in the casino. And I still wear it today, it's a good watch. Um, I had special clothes. I had a white suit, silk shirt, you know, things like that. As the heat from the casinos continues to build throughout 1993, the team tries dozens of disguise combinations. Many of them end up fooling no one. Now, I've seen this one Oriental guy in drag. I mean, it took me two days to keep from laughing. We had all kinds of stuff. It didn't work that well. It's pretty easy to tell when someone is wearing a lot of makeup. But we always tried. Of course, they tried. In the fall of 1993, with the casino's countermeasures starting to take their toll, yet another obstacle threatens the team's success. Bad luck. Yeah, starting in August, we just had this, this, what seemed to be a pretty nasty losing streak. I mean, nobody could win, and, and we dropped, probably in the next two or three months, we dropped at least half of what we won, if not more. And Mr. M in particular um, felt frightened and nervous about all this great wealth that he had suddenly accumulated disappearing too quickly. I mean, these are the ups and downs you have. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly 
bizarre about the results, mathematically, certainly. The players were like, well, hey, we're just getting paid a salary, you know. It's not our money. You know, we'll try to win, but sometimes you lose. Mr. M was very nervous. Around this time, there's a growing resentment among the players towards Mr. M and his partners. I think there may have been resentment on the part of, of people like Semyon and Katie during the strategic investments that they were you know, doing all the work, getting burned out, playing hard, making money for the team and not making as much of the money as they felt they should have. The incentives weren't lined up. The players weren't really didn't have enough of a stake in it. I definitely talked with uh, a lot of players, you know, as they got more and more to be equals with uh, the people who trained them. Um, yeah, people didn't think that the, the split was fair. Well, they wanted more. <laughs> we wanted more, they wanted more, everybody wanted more. <laughs> as if the team's latest troubles aren't enough, a shocking turn of events soon brings the MIT Blackjack team to the brink. It's mid-1993, and the MIT Blackjack team is in trouble. The casinos are rejecting them. They're in the middle of a nasty losing streak. There is a growing resentment towards management, and then, to add to the anxiety, are the effects of a surprising turn of events. Ah, one day, Mr. M was practicing with myself and a couple of other people, and he had the responsibility for a uh, brown paper bag with $125,000 in it, which is a typical amount of money we might carry. Someone had returned from a trip and transferred it to him. He was supposed to pass it to somebody else. Hey, fellas. Hey, where are those uh, player sheets from the Las Vegas trip? Player sheets are always at the back of the folder. And uh, he forgot it. Then the rest of us didn't notice that he had it and that he forgot it. So he left it under the desk and went home. And got distracted, went through the whole meeting, never thought about the money. Uh, went home that, that evening, didn't think about the money, uh, woke up at midnight or 1 o'clock or 3 o'clock in the morning, whenever it was, and went, holy shit. <laughs> I never gave him the money! I'm wandering around the halls of MIT. I don't know what to do. I mean, it's like 5 o'clock in the morning. I don't, I don't remember. The, I mean, I call a bill. I wake him up. I mean, right? It's like... You know, he's going, oh, you got to be kidding. And we started trying to search for it, look through the garbage, all sorts of stuff. we got to check every room. Every room. Come on. This was late enough in 93 where a lot of the team members had some resentment towards the, the management. So there, there was not a lot of help to those guys. It was like their money and they had to find it. Well, I didn't find it. The janitor who was scheduled to clean those rooms found it, opened it. I can't imagine what he thought when he opened this bag and found <laughs> that much money in it. The janitor turns the money into his supervisor, who contacts the MIT campus police. They, in turn, bring in the feds. And uh, the various agencies, I thought, most of the three-letter acronym agencies in the government had it passing from one to the next over months and years. They had to prove it's not drug money, they had to prove it's not any kind of fraud. And after a lot of legal bills, we got it done. The incident comes at a bad time for Mr. M. The team's losses have continued to mount. It's now down almost one million dollars. Most of its profit to date. Thanks to the Griffin book, their photos are plastered all over casinos around the world. As a result, more and more team members are being ejected from casinos. Thou shalt put out the money when thou hast the advantage. Thou shalt write everything down. Human memory is infinitely fallible. I think he lost a little bit of respect because he, he was very nervous and yet he was forgetful and a little disheveled and disorganized. So I think he lost a little bit of credibility. Absolutely, it affected how people saw me and, and felt. I, I mean, here I was, the 
founder of the team, one of the most responsible people they knew. I mean, you know, always reasonable, logical, whatever. And and all of a sudden, that he just <laughs> he just you know misplayed leaves one hundred twenty five thousand dollars on the floor. Well, what what would you think? I mean, so I was uh, absolutely distraught and emotionally devastated. The holiday season is well underway. Boston is glowing with decorations and celebrations. But for members of the MIT Blackjack team, morale is low. When you get into these bad times, when more than one thing goes wrong at the same time, it can be kind of like a perfect storm of bad news for the Blackjack team because you're losing money in the casino, which is depressing and financially a blow. Because there's less money around, or possibly no money for the players, people are even more resentment of the management share of the pie. There's also resentment over the other players. You know, how come Semyon's making so much more than I am, and you know, or or John's making all the money because you know, and it's the rules aren't set up fairly to let me make money. Um, and then there can just be plain old people not getting along. And now. The team founder seems to be losing his focus. I'm told that they actually had a meeting where I wasn't present, where they sort of discussed what should be done. The chemistry's a little off. Could Mr. M be fired from his own team? Could anyone take his place? And in the end, can you really break Vegas? <laughs> It's December 1993. Mr. M's vision of building a card counting team for the ages is being challenged on every front. The team definitely felt less solid. There was something unraveling at the seams. Heat from the casinos, player discontent, bad luck. Even Mr. M, the team founder, seems to be losing focus. I'm told that they actually had a meeting where I wasn't present, where they sort of discussed what should be done. The chemistry's a little off. I just think we need some new blood. Huh. What do you think about Semyon? Bring him on as a manager. The partners approach Semyon Dukach about taking a bigger management role. I, I may have been considered uh, as some kind of heir. Sure. Well, I was asked to, to do a lot of the work, but uh, they were still going to keep the bulk of the winnings. And by that point, I saw that there was just so much resentment among the players who felt like they were being burned out and they were risking and they were playing and these guys were making all the money that I didn't want to align myself with them. I felt it was time to just start something new. But out of respect to those who trained him, Semyon decides to wait until strategic investments disbands before forming another team. He doesn't have to wait long. Strategic investments. <clears throat> Hello? Bill. What happened was I basically called Bill up and said, first of all, I'm, I'm distraught over the money. And second of all, you've had this horrible losing streak. And I'm just like, both. I'm, I'm kind of fed up and I'm angry and I'm depressed. You know, I, I just don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm out. You know, if we were making tons of money, it'd be one thing. But we're not. And it's just an amazing headache, both from the money thing and, and the problems we were having with Griffin and players and problems with management versus the players. It just became not worth it to me. The management, having lost their million dollar uh, bounty, um, they felt like it wasn't worth all the long hours they're putting in and all the frustrations that are being caused and they, they were ready to give it up. And they did. By the end of December 1993, strategic investments is no more. Mr. M's vision to build the biggest, best organized blackjack team ever had succeeded, partially. While the exceptionally large team had experienced several great runs, it survived for less than two years, ultimately falling victim to player resentment 
Casino Heat, and like many organizations, uneven management. I think the lessons that can be learned from Mr. M's attempt to start the greatest MIT team ever are one, that if you organize a lot of smart, motivated people, you're going to do well. The players didn't have any incentive to win. But two, that you have to have all the members of your organization feel empowered. It does seem true that the very ambition, the very goals of strategic investments led to its demise. I'm convinced that there's a fairly strong link between the lack of incentives and that long run of bad luck. With strategic investments officially disbanded, Semyon Dukac is now ready to stake his own claim and start a team of his own. I think it's fair to say that I took the best of the ideas behind strategic investments in terms of legitimizing it, legalizing it, creating management and oversight, and took it to the next level, sure. And all of this is governed by the law of large numbers. It works. If you spend the next year making dozens of trips to casinos, and if you play by yourself, you could win a lot of money. But you could also lose a lot of money. That's the mess of the game. The fact that we started small and the players ended up win in being the investors and we won the money ourselves and it grew and grew and grew it was very satisfying. That's right. You played as part of a team. Semyon's team, which he calls amphibian investments, grows throughout the mid 1990s to employ over 60 players in five cities. The team's total win is reportedly over $4 million, making it the most successful MIT blackjack team ever. It became the successful MIT blackjack team. And then this reptile team that later had a book written about it was a smaller offshoot by people who were probably better at acting, better at blending into the casinos, uh, but didn't have as much of a formal structure, organization, tax forms, etc. We won a substantial amount of money after SI. The main reason that we won was because we were doing things in the way that Mr. M wanted to do um, as part of SI. Uh, so it, basically his legacy cost the casinos several million dollars over the next few years, four, five, six million dollars over the next, next three years. I didn't play blackjack for, for a while after that. Um, I, I looked into getting more into poker. Over the years, I got sort of burned out on a lot of the work. And I eventually pretty much got out of the whole thing by 1997, 98. The stuff I did before at MIT became more interesting in a lot of ways. So I ended up starting a software company with some of the money I made from Blackjack. Over time, most members of the original strategic investments team slip away from the shadowy world of Blackjack. But their bold plays and pure ambition have become the stuff of legend. We do everything that you've ever heard of and a lot of things that you haven't. Stick around, you'll, you'll, you'll learn it all. I think the moral of this story is that essentially, if you're smart enough, uh, you can beat a system that is unfair. Conventional wisdom can say something's impossible, but it can indeed be possible. There are a lot of people who told me, oh, you'll never make money in casinos, you know, that system can't possibly work. And yet, when you tr put your trust in people like Mr. M, who presented you with the facts and you believed in them, you could go and do it. The average visitor to Las Vegas stays three and a half nights, gambles for four hours a day, and has a gambling budget of around $500. The dream is simple, to take that 500 bucks, throw caution to the wind, and try to break Vegas. Yes, you can break Vegas. I would say to people, you can break Vegas. However, to do it, you have to be 100% serious about it. You need a large bankroll, you need to study blackjack, and you can only do it for a short amount of time. No, of course you can't break Vegas. <laughs> you can personally win some money. You can walk away from the tables up, in a, both in a real sense and in, a, in an expected sense. But, you, I mean, you're never going to bankrupt a casino or take down the city or anything. I don't think anybody can really break Las Vegas. It's just too big to be broken. Yeah.